It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing John Levitschka, CDT, Gina Panetta, a dentist in St. Louis, and Dr. Rice Spohr, who's a dentist in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Oh. So I'll read all your bio, starting with on the left of your screen. If, you, uh, if you're listening to us on um, iTunes, remember you can always uh, subscribe to us on uh, YouTube. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash Dentaltown Magazine. John Levitschka is the second generation owner and president of Dental Ceramics since 1988. In 2006, John founded the Center for Exceptional Practices, an ADA SERP and AGD PACE certified facility designed to enable restorative dentists to achieve higher levels of success in clinical practice through lecture and hands-on program. He has devoted more than 30 years to developing a dental laboratory that focuses on exceptional services, combining art, science, and technology with personal attention and care. He's a member of everything. I'm not going to read them all or we'd be here till midnight. Uh, Gina, Dr. Gina Panetta, is a graduate of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. After graduating from dental school, she completed a four-year tour in the United States Navy, where she completed a general practice residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. She currently practices family and cosmetic dentistry in Metro St. Louis. She values the importance of staying current with the newest dental techniques and materials. She is passionate about staying on the leading edge of dentistry and invests hundreds of hours into ongoing training, specializing in general cosmetic and implant dentistry. She's a member of the ADA, the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the International Team for Implantology. And my first question to her will be, how the hell did you move from San Diego to St. Louis? I mean, what, what, what was your next best idea? Um, Dr. Rice Spohr, accredited member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry, fellow of the International Dental Implant Society, fellow of the Pierre Fichard Society, who I guess Pierre's birthday was yesterday, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, yesterday. Um, he has been a leading dental educator since shortly after receiving his doctor dental surgery degree in 1983 from the University of Washington. Very early on, he realized that he excelled in artistic and mechanical skills. He served as an affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington Dental School for 10 years. He also teaches many aesthetic dental courses each year in the United States, Canada, and abroad. He lectures internationally, has been published in over 15 countries. He currently serves as an editorial reviewer for the Journal of Cosmetic Dentistry. His professional memberships include accredited member of the AACD, fellow of the AGD, fellow of the International Dental Implant Society, fellow of the Pierre Fichard Society. Dr. Spohr has completed hundreds of hours in continued education in dental implants and aesthetics, including courses with the Las Vegas Institute. As a fellow in the prestigious Pierre Fichard Society and a credit member of the AACD, he has been credited with the skills and techniques necessary to provide the rigorous attention to detail in the field of dental aesthetics. That is so cool, man. It is so fun on a Friday night to be talking to three dental super achievers. So my first question to you is very simple. I always ask my listeners, shoot me an email, Howard at Dentaltown.com. Tell me your name, how old you are, where you live, all that stuff. I'm telling you, um, they're all babies. They're 25% are still in dental kindergarten school and the 75% are pretty much only uh, are under 30. I only get like maybe one email a week that says I'm as old as uh, that they're uh, my age. So, uh, so my first question would be, how do you walk out of dental school and then end up being a great dentist? What, 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 what steps on their journey would you recommend? Well, I think one of the first things is that they need to have a vision of where they want to end up. And uh, in this group we have right here now, we're doing a class presently in Ohio. And we have uh, about eight dentists here doing a hands-on course where they're treating a patient. One of them is a year out of dental school. We also have another dentist that's prepping right now that's been practiced for 35 years. So there's a range. What all of them have, have decided is they've decided that aesthetics is something they're interested in. And it's partly because I think it's one of the more interesting parts of dentistry, but it also is an avenue that can get you out of a lot of the kind of day-to-day -day things that uh, we kind of get stuck in with practices. And one of the main things, or one of the main reasons I got into aesthetics to begin with was because it gave me freedom from being told by an insurance carrier what I could and couldn't do. Uh, a lot of the aesthetic cases involve more than one tooth. And what it really is, it's a side door to comprehensive care. 
And what we send out to the public is what we get back. So I look at what we create as being our total responsibility and the environment around us. It doesn't matter if you're in Seattle or Ohio or uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, it, it depends on what we send out to the people that are there. So you're at Dental Ceramics right now? Correct. And that's in Richfield, Ohio, south of Cleveland? Yes. 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 In between Akron and Cleveland. So when you, you said you're with a, so you're teaching a class now? Correct. Yeah. Ohio has a unique a licensing structure where we can bring dentists from anywhere in the states and go through a temporary licensing process. They will allow them to treat a patient here in the facility. We have dental chairs and we have a clinic to do aesthetics. There's also a lab that has a lot of very skilled technicians and the lab work's done here at the same time. And what, what's your class size? Well, it can be up to 16 at a time. We have eight chairs. And uh, this particular class, we have eight participating this time. Nine. Nine. So the course has eight chairs. Correct. And eight, you said eight chairs? Correct. And the class size would be 16. And they get a temporary license for the state of Ohio? Correct. And how hard is that at, that to do? Or is it's, it, or? it's very easy to do. It takes about... Uh, and they've streamlined it because you can do a lot of it online. And so we get some people in within three weeks. You want to be, you know, three months out knowing you're going to do it and apply. And the, the license is good for a year. And you have to bring your own patient of record. And uh, it just it works out very nicely uh, to be able to bring doctors from all over the country here to, with a live patient. It's a totally different learning experience than over the shoulder or auditing uh, an over the shoulder program. They're actually prepping the cases, temping, uh, pressions, everything's being done here. And then uh, four or five weeks later, uh, they are uh, seeding the cases and uh, they're under our supervision uh, with our systems and Dr. Spores' uh, systems. And it gives them systems to work with and understand. A lot of these doctors have done, been in practice for 30, 35 years. Some are new out of school, as Ryan said. They learn how to do eight to 10, 12 units of veneers, crowns, bridges, maybe or maybe not with implants, and then restore it and have, be able to go home with confidence. They see everybody else's cases. They see the problems that exist and they come up with and they learn that you know they're not alone and that they can make a phone call we're there to help guide them through cases when they're back home and they develop a lot of confidence so it's it's been very valuable in that sense so is it called the center for exceptional practices or the cleveland dental institute it's uh center for exceptional practices and uh the the lab is dental ceramics inc and you know it's I own both, and uh, I, I just my vision for the for the business was to uh, train doctors to become more insurance independent, uh, because this generally takes them out of the realm of insurance. Usually, if they're doing 10, 10 units at one time, and then that develops uh, confidence to do larger, more extensive cases, more comprehensive care. So it, it takes them to a different level. We do have some. We have an occlusion mastery series where where we take doctors through a series of four, uh, four programs over nine months, and then they, they learn how to put cases together, comprehensive care cases. How many different courses do you have? You said occlusion? Uh, we have uh, uh, implant courses, and they're mainly in the area of ceramic implant courses, solid zirconia implants from uh, uh, Sarah Root Systems to Zermax, and um, so, and uh, utilizing uh, uh, the PR, PRF with, uh, so we have brought in people, uh, Richard Myron from uh, PRF.edu. Uh, he's with Joseph uh, uh, Shukran. And so utilizing those materials and those uh, techniques for placing live patient placing ceramic implants. So that has been also very, uh, a very good program that we have here. So the the titanium has ninety nine 
probably 99 point something percent of the market. Do you see that changing in the future with these all ceramic uh, surgical implants? I, I do. I think there's a place for them. And uh, personally, I we've restored over 3,500 of them. And uh, when I look at, go back and look at the uh, photos and tissue and the health of these patients, they look much better. They, we see very, uh, very little periimplantitis with them. And uh, they just, they look like natural teeth uh, when they're restored. And of course, they've got to be done properly. And what, what's your favorite system? Um, a new system coming out from uh, Switzerland, uh, from Swiss Dental Solutions. That's a very good one. Uh, Zeramex is a very, very good system. Send me those. And, Tell, uh, repeat them again. The uh, Zeramex. Zeramax, Z-E-R-A-M-I-X? Uh, yes. Zeramax. From? Sarah Root. Sarah Root. They're from uh, um, Spain. Sarah Root uh, from Spain. Yeah. They, they've got, uh, uh, their, their system is a one-piece system. Uh, the others have one-piece and two-piece systems, and they've also developed uh, a screw retain system as part of it. So uh, we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, Nobel just uh, bought a company in Switzerland uh, that uh, produces uh, uh, zirconia implants. So there's, there's going to be, uh, I think, more going in that direction. Absolutely. But you, but you, you think there might be less periimplantitis with ceramics? Oh, it, it, definitely. There's no question about it. The, the, they've got the Sarah Root has got uh, great histological uh, slides and research that they did on it. That's amazing. It's really incredible. Well, I mean, that that's, that in itself is a whole game changer. I mean, I'm reading that at f just five years and 60 months, uh, 20% of implants have periimplantitis. And then at a five to nine years, it's 40%. Right. Well, when I, uh, I've, I've uh, taken a number of uh, lectures and courses, live patient courses with Ulrich Volz in Switzerland, and he has, uh, uh, he, he will... If done properly, he claims uh, no periimplantitis with these cases, years later. So what do you think about that? What, what do you other two dentists think about that? I mean, that, that's, I mean, if that really pans out to be true, then yeah. I mean, that, that's just a complete game changer. But I, I would agree. Uh, I've been more of a traditional titanium implant. That was my training. And that's still what I do the most of. But... The one thing that's changing is I think that we're looking at a lot of dentistry as being not just isolated. In other words, it's not just about the mouth, it's about the whole body. And uh, there's another concept that we're starting to look at a lot more carefully, and that's how it impacts overall health through like periimplantitis or chronic periodontal disease or chronic inflammation. But if you get that chronic inflammation there from whatever the source is, whether it's from an implant placement, whether it's from poor restorative dentistry, whether it's for a particular material or it's just natural process of people not you know, having surfaces that plaque attaches to. But if that inflammatory response is there, it does affect cardiovascular health and this is all part of it. And I think that even though we're teaching a class right now on aesthetics, what we're really talking about again is a window to get into comprehensive care. Uh, some of it involves all the, all the disciplines. But the comprehensive care where dentistry is not just decided by someone that's not involved in it. And we've got the philosophy here that the care comes first, the commerce follows. And if you keep those things in the proper order, what you end up with at the end is good, good for everyone. Everybody wins. Patients win. The dentists win. The laboratories win. The suppliers win. Everybody in the system works. And the fact is... Dentistry is an affordable thing for everyone. And I know most young dentists particularly, they're always concerned about what things cost. But the fact is, I think that in our society, people tend to uh, put value on things. And if they have enough value, they will spend the money and time and make the effort to seek what we do. I love that quote. The care comes first and the commerce will follow. Yeah, it does. And there's always a natural conflict between care and commerce. We all have to balance it in private practices. I'm in practice 35 years, so I'm at the, the autumn of my practice. But the fact is I've learned how to do it well, and I love coming here and showing dentists that there's another way when they're younger. They don't have to fall into the traps of feeling like, well, I have to do this because somebody else is saying it. 
They're doctors, my gosh, and they have a skill set, and we should foster that. And what are your thoughts, Gina? Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, one important thing that to point to point out, of course, is that um, giving patients what they want. I think the one thing that this course teaches is gives us the ability to to provide more to our patients. Um, so um, we're able to do more dentistry, better dentistry, and um, and see patients um, get healthy. I think that's important. But Gina, do you think that um, if ceramics have less periimplantitis, do you think that's going to be a huge game changer? I think it will be a game changer, but I guess when is the question? It may, I, I don't think everybody's going to catch on to it right away. Um, well, I only place titanium implants, so right now, but I intend to do more and more research on it. So I think, I think eventually it may catch on. Now I want to I want to ask a different question. Um, a lot of the kids feel they didn't get enough training in occlusion. Um, a lot of labs when they see. I, I mean, I remember when Carl Misch. You know, he he nailed removable first, and what got him interested in implants was when these people were saying that the the titanium was breaking. And when he'd look at the case, he'd say, "Well, God, your bites off so bad. I mean, you know, of course it broke." And so he he thought that the cross training of of learning occlusion and, and removable and finding a bite and all that was just a critical element to his uh, success in full mouth restoration. And, um, but, but the problem with occlusion, if you talk to a hundred endodontists, they really don't argue about anything. They, they don't, it's hard to even get a fight going with, with a bunch of endodontists. Go take five of them to dinner and try to start an argument with them. It's hard. Pediatric dentistry, about the only thing, you know, uh, you know very little, but gosh, when you start talking occlusion, I mean, it's, it's like setting down five people from five different major world religions. Uh, so why, why is that? Well, first of all, do you agree with that assessment? Do you agree that occlusion has no. all these different camps? Occlusion's like talking about religion and politics. Just add occlusion to the list. That's the best way to start an argument, typically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, what, what, so what advice would you give to these young kids? How, how do they go out and learn occlusion? Well, I think you have an open mind. And... You know, there are a lot of different ways to view it. The fact is the human body is pretty tolerant. Good thing we are. Because you can see people from all different uh, ages and, and they have all kinds of things in their mouth and some of them work really well. For example, I had a patient who passed away recently and she was my record age patient. She was 107 and a half when she died. And I treated her for 30 years. And the dentist that saw her before me saw her for most of her adult life and he literally did thumbprint amalgams, and, and she had teeth in her head. So what I learned by treating her was, one, she had a genetic disposition that was different. She lived to be 107 and a half, and you don't make it that far unless you're different. So if we could take that magic thing she had, it would solve most of the problems we have, but we don't get that. So when you talk about occlusion, everybody's got their sort of base to start from. And what I've kind of learned is it depends on the patient. I've used pretty much every philosophy and technique that, that I've been aware of. Uh, LVI had one, uh, Dawson's, Spear, Kois. You go down to whatever the current list is. But the fact is they have a lot of common things about them. The, usually the starting point is the arguing point. After you get past that, they're really common. I mean, you have to have maximum intercuspation. You have to have the muscles aligned so that the envelope of function works in a way that the teeth don't run into each other. And if you get that, it pretty much works. And you get these fringe things where you get a few patients that are either they're always painful or they've got some other issue that, you know, their functions are, are, are uh, compromised. But the fact is most people fall into the center. And what we've learned from doing the aesthetic approach is, the, and the reason I got involved in even looking at occlusion, because inherently it doesn't interest me all that much. But if I make an aesthetic, if I do an aesthetic set of uh, veneers, I want them to last. And if I put them in and they immediately can break them off or they become painful, then obviously something's wrong. So what we've come to understand is that the occlusion is the base. 
And whatever system you use, and they all seem to work because they all exist. And the fact is, if one of them worked profoundly better than the others, we wouldn't even have the argument. But it's about the tolerance that most people have. We're all different. And I think most of it depends on the details and the skill level of the individual dentist doing it. Because I've seen every one of the systems work. Well, let me ask all three. Uh, I, I want to ask a specific, because this is what they specifically ask when you're lecturing in dental schools. How do you make the judgment between a triple tray versus I need full arches upper and lower versus I need a face bow transfer and an articulator? I think you need to. Uh... I see that no one wants to answer this question. <laughs> 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 I, I, I feel you need a, uh, uh, an, an occlusional background and you need a philosophy. And I'm very involved at the Panky Institute. I'm visiting faculty there. I'm on their board. So I am very fond of uh, the Panky Institute. So I recommend many doctors to go there and you develop a philosophy. I also, uh, uh, we have developed a, a system that we also uh, have here at the center and that we teach, and it's uh, utilizing a, uh, a uh, basically, uh, for a uh, better word, would be a Lucia jig, and it's similar to that, but it's more as an appliance. And so, you know, it's, it's just a, a way of learning a system or having a system in place that you can uh, see where these patients are going. You know, are they gonna have problems? Do they have problems? You get them out of pain before you start any treatment. And that's where we like to begin. You know, work on these patients before you do any dentistry. Make sure they're not in pain, they're comfortable before you start. And then know where you're going before you start. And that's where, as a laboratory, I say, why are we getting these cases midstream or the there's 10 implants in and all of a sudden I get a case with impressions. And I go, where's your wax up? Where's your diagnostic workup? And there is none. So we're working backwards now to recapture all that. We like to do that in the beginning with getting a diagnostic workup, making sure that it's, uh, uh, it's there where we want to go. And we know ahead of time it's going to work before we start because we can try it in. We can make matrices. We can take these wax ups using the Visacryls and, and get to the final, final stage of where we're going before we start. And that's, that's I think, where we need to be going more. Uh, with uh, our philosophy. So I would add to that that if you, the question specifically about if you do a triple tray or if it's a full arch or if you do a full workup, it depends on what the patient presents with. So there are certain patients, which is a large group, especially younger ones, you can get away with a triple tray. And a lot of dentists do that for convenience. It's still probably not the best way to do it, but it's an effective way to do it. I do most of my dentistry with full arch impressions, even if it's single crowns, because it's a, it's a more reproducible uh, occlusal pattern. And again, it depends what's there. So if you look, for example, at a patient that has a wear pattern, what that wear pattern is, whatever it is, it's a history of what they did. And if you're gonna change something, like for aesthetics or if they're in pain and you want to change it, you have to change the underlying environment because what causes the pain is the muscles that drive the teeth and they're all dynamic. And if you don't change that environment, they're going to just recreate that. So one of the things we all agree on here is we do a lot of test driving. So if we're going to do a case where we've got either someone starting in pain or if they have severe wear, even if it's not severe, uh, but they have significant wear, or if there's a combination of things where we're doing a lot of dentistry, we wanna get the maximum longevity, we wanna know that that's gonna work before we start. So we'll do a lot of things with either removable appliances or test driving the final occlusal position in provisionals to find out if that patient can tolerate it. I've done that for most of my career and the fact is most of the time it works. It works very well but you don't go into it blindly and you don't necessarily use the easiest way because it's the cheapest to get there. And, and Gina can tell you, cause she's digital. So let Gina speak mm -hmm. to you about. Yeah, that was, that was actually my next question. Do you guys uh, prefer old fashioned wax up or do you like these digital mock-ups? Gina, what are your thoughts? 
Um, we more recently have been using the digital scanner and doing um, digital wax ups. And um, with what system? The Trios. And we use three shape in the web. So. Well, yeah, three shape makes Trios. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting one because just today we do a lot with this in this aesthetic course with mock ups. So we'll do a diagnostic wax up, take and make a matrix, put it in the patient's mouth. We use that for a lot of things. We use it for showing, you know, what the case is going to look like ahead of time, looking at the phonetics, looking at the occlusal uh, interferences that might be developed. We use it a lot in the process as we're doing the preps. We usually start from the end result and prep backwards. So we prep through the mock ups and it keeps them more conservative. But what was interesting today, we had this discussion. So I'm more of a traditional wax guy. In fact, I do all my own wax ups at home, always have, and I haven't really gotten into the digital. But here at the lab, it's all digital. So today we were comparing some diagnostic wax ups that were done traditionally with a stone model and wax compared to the digitally produced printed models. And there's pros and cons to both of them. And I can see that. One of the main things we can see so far is if you're actually in a clinical setting and you're looking at a model in three dimensions in your hand and you're trying to use that to reference how to prep, if you can't see differences in coloration, printer models right now that I've seen are all one color, and you can't see what the delineation is between the added part and the natural tooth structure underneath, it's a little bit of a hindrance. That's why I still like wax. But what we came to find out today is you can use a combination. You take a printed model, if it's not quite right, you can carve it back, you can add wax at the time, it's either going to go and reprinting one. So I think there's a way to do both. What printer are you using? Uh, Form Lab. Out of Boston? Out of Boston, yeah. And uh, we are also, uh, we uh, are in the big, beginning stages of printing uh, dentures and uh, getting uh, cases set up for uh, the surgical guides and the surgical guides are printed and we're milling, we're also milling dentures out of PMMA and uh, that's uh, been very successful. And I, so, and I, and I want to I remind the young kids, this, you know, I, I practice in Phoenix. My dental office just celebrated its 30 year anniversary, uh, September 21st of last year. And a lot of people retire here uh, from the, the north. It's 10% Canadians. It's uh, North and South Dakota, all that stuff. But when I was um, in the doing free implant mode because I was you know trying to get cases and going and I'd see a case and I'd say you know I'll do this for you for free. I was shocked at how many people said, well I, I don't have a problem. I, I love my dentures. I, I can eat anything. And it made me realize all the way back then, you know, if you make a denture perfect, if you make it right, if you really master that craft, you'd be surprised at how many people love them. And it's the lowest cost full mouth cosmetic rehab case you could ever do for so many uh, poor people uh, in the, live here in the valley. And, um, you know, just. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're seeing where right now we're printing the economy denture and then we're milling the higher end denture. And uh, the PMMA is it's milled. You got tooth, tooth colors that are, you know, size of the gingival. And then, you know, we use the uh, composites uh, on the facials to finish off the pink. And that's going to change. That technology is going to change where we'll have the pink pucks to, uh, you know, placing a full arch. We're mill milling the full arch, not individual teeth. So we mill the full arch and then glue it to the base, basically. And right yeah. now, we're doing it all in one piece. And, you know, if you look at yeah. GM, you know, for years, they had five price points. They had, you know, Chevy, Pontiac, Olds, Buick, Cadillac. And so many of these young kids don't understand market segmentation where, you know, there's a lot of upgrades in indenture. I mean, Ivy Claire makes some amazing, gorgeous teeth. So when um, people are throwing prices around, you know, they should throw a lower price and a higher price. In fact, uh, some of the most successful implantologists I know, um, what they actually did is they bought the overlooked denture world that had been in the poorest part of town for 30, 40 years. They picked it up for nothing, and then they took that denture world and all that existing brand name, and then when everybody was coming back, they'd say, well, we could upgrade it to a nicer denture with nicer teeth, or put it on two implants, or put it on four implants, or all on four, I mean, and it was just amazing. And they said, you know, if you just converted 1% of their clients coming in to all on fours, I mean, they, they, 
they they built three. There was one in Bakersfield that I think he took it from like a three hundred thousand to like nine million a year in revenue. Yeah. I mean, just uh, again, market segmentation. But the only way that works is they obviously provided you know care that was proper enough that the people that were getting it valued it. And when people start to value what we can really do, they're willing to buy it. They buy everything else. And for some reason, we think that you know, dentistry is lying the bottom of the totem pole, and it really is. It depends on how we put it out there. And if we can show people there's really that kind of value in it, they will seek it. That's what we've all seen. You know, they come out of school. Um, we were in AT still last, a couple of Sundays ago, and I mean, there was one kid that was going to graduate five hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. I mean, you, you, so a lot of them when they come out of school, uh, say they're two fifty, three fifty in debt. Well, if they go buy a chair side milling machine, that's a buck thirty five. If they go buy some of these lasers, those are going to be between seventy five and one hundred and thirty thousand. They go buy a CBCT, there's another hundred grand. I mean, they literally come out of school and say. Dude, if I buy three things, I just doubled my student loan debt. So the question specifically is if they want to grow up to be great dentists like you, what do you think they have to buy? I think they have to buy knowledge and skill. They have to learn how to do this and do it efficiently and do it well. And that's what we don't see. They're not getting this, this skill. You know, we went through that era of uh, Pack Live, Aesthetic Advantage, LVI, all these live patent courses. And then they sort of disappeared for a long time. But now there's a whole new generation of dentists there that haven't experienced that live patient program that's so valuable. You know, these doctors leave here, they, they haven't even prepped a veneer in their career. And now they're doing 10 or 12 units. And they go back and they learn to market it properly and start learning how to sell or educate their patients. And they're doing... Uh, in the next year, they're doing 10 or 12 or 15 cases they would have never even looked at. So now, if they do that, now they can go, you know, afford those other toys they'd like to buy. And they'll pay off their loans, which would be the first thing I would do, their school loans. So that's, we're seeing a, a resurgence in a live patient program because they learn systems. And systems are efficient. They learned to do it efficient. And, and you know who should get credited for that whole revolution was Bill Dickerson. I mean, he literally led that revolution. And I mean, I remember taking his course, but it was still in his dental office, you know. And I mean, he, my gosh, he, he knew something was going on. And uh, man, he built a monster. But, but uh, you think they're having a resurgence now? I think, uh, well, I think so. I, mean, I think uh, there's a place for this type of course. Uh, you can't do this online. You got to prep teeth. You know, experience, you know, the something breaking, something the impression not being taken properly, uh, uh, something not fitting properly. You, you need to experience that with somebody with more confidence, more charisma, more you know, whatever, to then get through that case and learn how to fix it, or you know, when do you punt and redo it? And that's really important. Uh, it's. Go ahead, Rice. We, we've tried to set this up. In fact, our tagline is uh, learning by doing. And it's not learning by showing. It's learning by doing. So we purposely make it so that I may jump in or Gina may jump in or whoever else is helping. And I have, we have several people that come in and, and assist. But we'll show them something. We'll let them do it. And then we'll let them struggle with it. So just for example, today we were in the clinic. They actually started prepping at 1 o'clock p.m. It's now quarter to 8 p.m. And they finished about 45 minutes ago, most of them. So they basically kind of went through the muck for the last six hours. And we helped them. We're not going to let them make a mistake. But that is the best way to learn. And I found that to be the most effective. So one of them in there, he's been out of school a year. He's never prepped a veneer. He left today after he prepped 12, and his level, the quality of the result was about equal to mine. And I've been doing 35 years, and that's the point. We want to pass on that knowledge because they can get a jump start on this. There's a lot of people that want this, they, and I know they're in debt, but that doesn't mean they have to give up. So, but, but you made something profound that you were saying – you don't have, you know, what's more important than buying shiny boxes with lights on them is to buy the training. Uh, so you, you say invest in the hands-on training would be the best return. 
Absolutely. And learn how to do comprehensive care. And that's where, I mean, I'm going to be biased because I want uh, doctors to go to Pinky. It's a nonprofit institute. So it's very different from all the others. Very different. And I just think it's a wonderful place to go. And uh, so I, I will definitely push my doctors or doctors when they ask, where should they go? But as far as a live patient experience, that's what we have. That's, you know, that's my marketing away from Panky. But I think Panky is just one of the best institutes in the country. Was for a long time, sort of faded. And now they're making a resurgence. There's a lot of, uh, Leanne Brady is back uh, there. She's clinical director. Uh, uh, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Dale Sorensen, Mike Fling. You know, you got some really wonderful, wonderful people there. Ricky Broswell has done an incredible job. She came from the laboratory again. She was at uh, NADL, uh, National Association of Dental Laboratories, ran that for, I think, 10 or 12 years, and then came over to paint. So it's it's been a phenomenal place. Uh, a, there's a resurgence. Uh, Gina went there on my recommendation. So, <laughs> and she might Yeah, I went there. I went, I went, I went, I spent five weeks. What, what is the name of that resort across the street on the ocean? There's Key Biscayne. Yeah, I keep a scheme. But what, what's the name of that hotel right across from the Panky? That's uh, well, right on. It's there's a Ritz. They're on Key Biscayne now, and they have their own building. Right. They're building a dormitory. But I wondered, do, you, do you remember swimming there? You don't remember? I took you guys there five times for a week, and they don't even remember. <laughs> I should have left them at home with a babysitter. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be calling you for an alumni donation. <laughs> that's that's going to be my next phone call. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, I I. I when I look back at everybody in my neighborhood, um, you know, that I've been running with for 30 years, the number one variable they all had in common that rode to the top was they all devoured about 100 hours of CE a year. And then when you meet that one guy across the street and he hasn't, and, he, and, he, and he's always complaining about why does he have to take, you know, these uh, three classes to get his license renewed, I'm just like, oh my God. I mean, that just separates the cream. But of, of all those that you just uh, commented on, Howard, the reason that they sought that is because they actually care about their patients. The care came first. And I still believe, I remember going, you know, filling out forms to go to dental school. And one of the things they ask you is, well, why do you want to do this? And I think almost all of us said, we want to care for someone. And somehow that gets lost. When you get into big debt, I understand that. But this kind of a process where you can show people a way, and that was what's interesting about this guy that prepped today. He was proud of himself when he left. I mean, he accomplished something he thought he couldn't do. We helped him through it, and he's not quite finished, but he's got that confidence. So when he goes back, he's going to be different. And that's the first step. That's how you dig out of the hole. But, can you, but are you currently doing it all? I mean, can it all be done old school impressions? Sending it to lab, not needing a chair side milling, not needing an oral scanner, not needing. A absolutely it can. But that's not how the future is going. And I think you can do both. I mean, I'm learning. I don't need to learn. I could do this the way I've been doing it. But the fact is it still works. It's just like computers. They were wonderful. But you know what? Pencil and paper still works. And there are times when it still is an appropriate thing to do. So the, the basis, the, you know, the, the whole care concept and whatever you decide to take it, if you're going to do it in aesthetics or periodontics or oral surgery, whatever it is, it's still, if you can put that first, I truly believe that other people seek that and they, they understand that. And that overrides a lot of the other parts that get in the way. You know, I am. Um, by, by lecturing around the world, I've, I've lectured dentists in 50 countries, you see um, this rodeo playing out, you know how rodeo starts and, you know, you see the rodeo, like, like when I got out of school 30 years ago, the NHS ruled the UK, but it was starting to crumble and crumble and cr And they just kept lowering the pay, lowering the pay, lowering the pay. So now you go over there and they got 5,000 dentists in the UK that walked away from the system and said, I, I can't even treat my family with these types of fees. And they walked away. And I, I see that race to the bottom swings back and I'm starting to smell it uh, in, in the United States because when I got to school, I would send my fees to Delta and they'd pay 100% of my fees for clean exams, x-rays, 80% fillings and root canals. But now 30 years later, I'm getting 42% less than I did three decades ago 
But every time the Earth goes around the sun, you have inflation. Uh, you, uh, so um, it seems like if they're just walking out of school right now, I wonder if they're kind of like walking out into the NHS back in the uh, late 80s because these uh, insurance companies show uh, no um, thoughts of increasing your fees. And, and they, um, well, what do you think about that rant? Well, I think, it's, I think it's absolutely right. I haven't participated with an insurance company in almost 30 years. I've been a true fee for service and I'm in the middle of Seattle and Delta country. My office in Seattle has got 450 dentists within a five block radius and I've done okay. Are you serious? 450 dentists within five blocks? Medical dental buildings full of dentists. And I actually just semi-retired. I just sold my practice to a specialist. But we've got an idea of a model there. I've run it as a fee-for-service practice. What I, what I figured out is you go after what people want. And aesthetics was my door. Now, there are a lot of people using implants as that door now because there's a need for it. There's a want for it. And that's a big difference. They, people want that. But I still believe that people will always seek aesthetics because every one of us this morning looked in the mirror. We care about how we look, we care about how other people think about us, but most importantly, we care about how we feel about ourselves. And dentistry helps with that. We hear it over and over. And, I, and you know what, the, I think the most important piece of high-tech equipment is that no one ever talks about, is your camera. Because these dentists that document their cases and put them on their website, they don't realize these millennials, they're going on their iPhone to your website. And when they see amazing work done, they're getting on Southwest Airlines and flying to other cities or, or driving. They might think, well, there's no one in Parsons, Kansas that can do this. I have no problem driving to St. Louis or Kansas City. But the dentists getting all those have their cases where it says, these are my cases. These, and, and it's amazing. Yesterday, the first day of this course, it's a five-day course. Guess what the, the subject is? It's called photography. We spend nice. All, we spend all day learning to do not only intraoral, but we do studio shots for that exact reason. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just, that, 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 that was probably worth the whole course right there. If you can develop the staff of getting the pictures and digitizing them, getting them on their website, and that's just a game changer. Well, the other, the other thing that uh, uh, we encourage and we want their team members to come to this, front desk to assistance, so they understand when the doctor comes back from a, a program by himself, the, the assistants aren't on board, the front desk isn't on board. The, the whole team needs to come here and be on board to see what's going on. They're learning a lot, a lot more. And then they're a team when they go back and they go, yes, this is the kind of dentistry we'd like to do. We'd like to provide this for our patients. And, and I'd like to remind uh, the, the dentists out there listening of um, where there's some solid research in America. You know, there, there's a, a third of a billion people. There's 325 million Americans. And all throughout the 30 years, right at about half of Americans will always survey that they buy on price. They want to go the cheapest, whatever their plan covers, whatever. But the other half doesn't they actually care and want better and a lot of people think uh well my neighborhood's poor but look at them the money they're spending on their nails their hair their teeth all these things like that so um you could you can go like when i was lecturing uh when ryan and i were in uh um cambodia and what was the other country malaysia, malaysia. it was amazing in these poor cities how many girls had invisalign and you're looking at their house and you're like, wow, I mean, that house, that country, and her beauty, her self-confidence, her self-esteem was, I'm buying Invisalign. I mean, it was amazing. And it's very, very common in some of the poorest villages you'll ever find in the world. All the cute girls are walking around with Invisalign because it's important to them. It is important to them. And we discount that. We forget that. And it's, it's, it's really a shame it's happening. And it's, I think some of it's by design. I mean, the insurance companies stick their nose in the middle. And I'm not totally anti-insurance, but I'm anti-insurance at the point where it starts to decrease the quality of care. And heck, I've been in practice 35 years, and I can tell you the whole 35 years, insurance has decreased the quality of care. Because they keep doing what you said. I mean, they just keep lowering the rates, and the, everything costs more. We've got businesses to run. Well, the thing that, you know, the, the exact point I have with um, 
insurance and basically the the government healthcare systems is they're not trying to help anyone they're trying to control everyone for instance if if medicaid um said okay i'll only pay a hundred dollars towards a filling but the dentist can charge whatever he wants and then they'll have a list these are the dentists that take the fee as fee but the other ones it'll be a subsidy they don't allow their benefit to subsidize a nicer decision so you're not going to have a chevy a pontiac an olds a buick a cadillac they're going to try to destroy all the cadillacs and buicks and chevy and bring everybody down to this chevy and right. that's where it's and, and and for no purpose i mean if if i am an insurance company and i gave megan sue a hundred dollars towards her filling um and she found someone that'll do that filling but it'll be a silver filling but she wants to go across the street and pay two hundred dollars because she wants a tooth colored why isn't that her call and then the same stupid idiot government people are always talking about why so many dentists don't uh take medicare it's because you're not it's not a subsidy you're trying to control the industry just take away the controls and let them apply it to that procedure at that fee or apply it to a nicer procedure to a higher fee why are you trying to control the people well, that's, well that's, that's a good question. That's, that's uh, my my uh, parents left Czechoslovakia in 1948 because of that reason. They wanted freedom, and uh, they escaped and went to Italy and they came to the United States. And, and they they wanted the freedom. Now, and another and another thing they're talking about in Congress right now, which I hits a very raw spot with me. I'm actually living in a house that an American sold me because she had to go get her drug made in America, but the only place that she could get it was in Scandinavia. And I'm like, okay, the same thing with the FDA. Okay. You know, I'm a consumer. I can see, oh, this drug's not FDA approved, but I'm going to be dead in a year. And the only long shot is this new deal. And they're spending five years on monkeys and rats and mice. But you're telling me as a taxpayer that there's a federal agency that won't let a dying American try a drug from an American company. And every time I ever saw Senator McCain, I said, you let these casinos on the reservations. Why don't you make those Indian reservations FDA free zones so that people don't have, I mean, it's bad. And look at hospice. What's the whole point of hospice? So you can die in the comfort of your home. How would you like to die in a foreign country? Because your own country wouldn't let you take a medication even though you're dying. I mean, it's, it's about control. And that's the specific issue that gets under people's skin. It, it is ours too, and that's part of the reason we're doing this. We want to give back to the the level we can to give some of these other people a chance to do what we've done. Okay, we'll talk specifics. Um, this five day course, do you, like like Pinky, it was real easy because they have week one, week two, week three, and you had to take them in order. There was there was no decision made. Do you have a recommended pattern? Um, you, you said this five days or all the course five days. How much do they cost? Talk specifics to my homies about um, how they would do this. Okay, sure. Uh, we have the uh, aesthetic course that is uh, approximately uh, 5,000 uh, plus lab work. And uh, then, uh, then we have our occlusion mastery series uh, that is uh, about 10,000. Uh, has four sessions over a nine month period. And, uh, but that course also includes uh, uh, an upper arch or lower arch of restorative uh, crowns and bridges that we, we make here as part of the course. So they understand where they can phase their cases in. So that, that is the, those are the two programs we have. So the main program is, is one week, five day, Monday through Friday? Uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, the aesthetic course is uh, three days. Uh, there's photography, then two days of prep session, uh, and uh, prep and temp, and then about four to five weeks later is a seat session, and that's two days. And uh, doctors bring their patients back, seat the cases. The uh, and that whole course is five thousand spread out over. Uh, five thousand. Uh, you well, you give your deposit, pay up front. And uh, uh, you go from there. I mean, that's uh, you, you pay for the lab work at the end of the session. And is the average person bringing one patient for one case? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
the uh, one of the other marketing tools that, that I use at Dental Ceramics for our clients and doctors that are coming into the course and become our clients, we give them diagnostic workups, mock-ups, so they can uh, provide these for the patients, show their patients. We provide them up front at no fee. Uh, when they do the case, we do charge them for that wax up. But then there's no there's no hindrance as far as uh, doing uh, a mock-up for your patients. We have some doctors that are doing 10 a month, and we have other doctors that are um, wondering why they haven't done any. They're not, they don't have to pay for this up front. You, don't, you only pay for it when you do the case. So that's a, it's been a great uh, 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 project, I guess uh, you would say, for us, and it's worked very well. We're doing a lot of aesthetic rehabs, and then those are leading into full mouth uh, comprehensive care cases also. And you're talking about all these courses are at your um, facility in Ohio? Yes. Correct. And, and how far are you from the uh, water? We're half an hour from downtown Cleveland and uh, about 20 minutes from downtown Akron. My gosh, um, I absolutely, uh, you got the, um, the NFL Football Hall of Fame, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I love that little bar district by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but um, my gosh, that is, uh, that, that, I love that uh, downtown, that lake area. That, that is really nice. It has changed dramatically over the last uh, number of years. It is a great place to be. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And in that uh, aesthetics course, we call it a, a aesthetic excellence, uh, we purposely designed it so that there was a gap between the prep and the seat, not only because the lab work's done, but what I know from 35 years of experience is anytime you do a significant aesthetic change for a patient, they need time to adapt. So it allows time to see if the, the design we came up fits an occlusal pattern that works for the patient, does the phonetics work, but most importantly, psychologically, you're going to accept what you do. The last class we did last uh, fall, we did approximately 140 units, and I think we seated almost all of them at the second night. We had maybe one or two that didn't seat, but that kind of, of, of success range is what we've seen consistently, and it's partly because we wait long enough. Uh, a lot of times, I think, especially with younger doctors, we're so used to the fast food society, meaning you know you want it now, you get it now, and you're finished. And that's not the way this works. A lot of these people that are coming and seeking aesthetics, particularly, it's taken them decades to get to this point. And if you reverse it too quickly, they just don't psychologically accept it. So there's a process. But the nice thing about it is if you get them through that initial process, they're way more interested in the rest of the dentistry. I mean, they follow up on everything once they get what they want. Well said. Um, I'm going to go back to Gina. She thinks she's going to get out of this podcast without talking. I'm going <laughs> to just, man, what a pioneer. You went and joined the Navy for four years. That was, and that was a long time ago. You get, got out of school um, in 2000. Was that a pretty much an all male deal? And, and what would you say to someone in school that's thinking of a residency um, and was thinking about the military? Cause uh, I thought it was a great opportunity. Um, I love serving my country and um, I got great training doing the residency in San Diego. So I would definitely encourage anybody. My, in fact, my daughter's a second year in dental school now and has applied to one of the programs to try to go. And what percent was it a uh, male back then in 2000 when you went? It was probably majority. I would probably say 80% male, but I think at the time that I was in school, at least in my school, um, we were becoming more, uh, we had a higher percentage of female um, dentists in training. So you were four years in San Diego? No, I did one year in San Diego and I did three years in Norfolk Naval Station and Little Little Creek Amphibious Base. So how many times a week do you wish you still lived in San Diego? <laughs> <laughs> Is it three times a day or three times a week? <laughs> Especially in the winter. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just visited my mom in uh, Kansas uh, um, last weekend, and uh, my gosh, it was, I left here, and it was 76, and you get there, and it's freezing cold, and the wind, it's always blowing. In fact, I remember when I was little, the wind only stopped blowing one time, and everyone fell down. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> crazy, crazy. So what? Uh, that was an hour. I can't believe uh, that we already went a whole hour. Um, I want you to just to end closing thoughts. 
um, you're basically talking in two markets. They're, they're, they're young kids, and they're, they're a quarter in dental school. The rest are out of dental school. They're under 30. Most of them are all working in associates. And I know everybody talks about associates as the big DSOs, but the truth of the matter is 80% of those associates are in private practice. And they all want to leave. Um, and, you know, I always tell everybody in dental school, well, if an associateship at a DSO was a great deal, then why does their average dentist only stay one to two years? And then if being an associate in private practice is a great deal, it's the same statistic. I mean, it's, it's just the same statistic. So you can't, uh, most dentists at the end of the day, they want to call their own shots. They want to be their own boss. How, um, what advice would you give her? Um, she wants to, uh, she's walking around the swimming pool, just dipping her toe in it. What advice to get her to dive in the pool and open up her own business? I would say, I think begin with the end in mind, begin with the end in mind. So start where you are, but I think you need to look towards where you end up, you know, at the end of your practice. And I think, I think one thing about this training is just another tool in your toolbox that you're able to provide your patients. One thing great about Rise and John and taking this particular course is that um, they're very approachable. It's not like going to a large course with 70 people and you're trying to get a takeaway from it. And you may get one or two takeaways. When you go to this particular course, um, I think you're, you're coming away from it more confident in your um, ability to practice and do more large cases. And I think that's something that a lot of young dentists want to have, but they don't know where to get the training. And another, another profound thing he said was, uh, I was uh, um, visiting, you know, I, I'm so dumb. When I go on a vacation, if I see a dental office, I walk in. I mean, I just, <laughs> I do every time. But it's so funny how you'll be talking to a dentist in these small towns in Kansas, like, like um, um, Derby, Kansas, uh, Rose Hill, Kansas. And sometimes people will say, we well, you know the, these people here don't have a lot of money, so we, I can't really want to do that high-end stuff. And I'm like, hey, Bozo, uh, what does that F-150 truck cost right there? And you look at the Circle K in Kansas, there, I, you can almost never see a car. And there's like six F-150s at the Circle K. You know how much those things are? 100,000 if it's totally decked out. And, you know, sixty-five to 70000 if it if it doesn't have anything in it. And it's like, so that guy's got 70000 bucks for a truck, but he's not going to get his teeth fixed? You're, you're, the, that, that, that's, it doesn't even make sense. People have, always find the money for what they want. That is correct. We have two doctors here from Kansas. Oh, yeah? So, what cities? I, I don't know, but I know they're from Kansas. So. Yeah, right on. Are they uh, the two best students in the class? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right you know it's it's about creating enough value that patients want it i mean dentistry is a good thing we're not selling death here we're not selling tobacco and that did really well for a while so we've got something that makes lives better and it's certainly that the people that provide it they've spent a lot of their life training for it so they might as well enjoy it because at the age I am now, I'm a little older than you are, Howard, but the fact is life is short. And you better enjoy every day because you don't get to do it again. And like Gina said, if you have that goal in mind and you wish for it, I still believe it's possible. You know, Ryan, Ryan's thinking about us doing this really neat project that I'm going to keep nudging him to do every day about uh, finding all the 100-year-olds um, retired in Ahwatukee and asking for their parting advice because I've always done that in my practice. I can't believe you had someone that was 107 and a half. That's amazing. But every time, every time I had a patient that was 90 to 100, I'd always say, what, what's the secret to life? They <laughs> always say that, you know, you're asleep a third of the time, you're at work a third of the time, you're with your family a third of the time. But with regards to work, they go, never do things you don't like to do for money. Get some job that you love. And the happiest people liked their job. They liked going to work. And, and it didn't even, you know, that is so important. I, I feel so sorry for people who go to work every day and they hate it. It's like, well, fix it. I had one dentist tell me he'd rather be beat with a stick than do a root canal. I said, dude, they're called endodontist. Don't ever do 
a root canal again because it's going to take away your smile. You're going to get burned out. That might lead to drinking uh, or beating your cat or whatever. The, just make fix what's broken. You spent all this time becoming a dentist and you don't like it. Well, what, what part do you don't like? Fix what you don't like. But I know a lot of them feel overwhelmed. But there is a way out. But they chose to go there in the first place. They've got the, they actually have the brains to do it. They got through dental school. So I know that they possess that. It's just that sometimes it just gets beat down. And it's still there. And that's one of the reasons we like doing this, especially with people that are younger. Because there's a spark that gets lit. And once that spark is lit, it does not go out. Nice. Their, their ability to, to dream and then actually create their own type of practice in in their minds you know the, the develop the end in mind you know in the beginning make see the end and uh, picture it and you can get there you know that I, I see it I see the happening all the time I've been doing this for many years and uh, I've seen those practices succeed and grow and I've also seen those that have just fizzled and uh, and quit and you've seen cities shrivel and then come back i mean it, you know even even cities have this type of deal but uh gentlemen it's friday night and you just show it's eight o'clock at night and you you decided to spend an hour talking to my homies i really really appreciate it uh thank you so much for coming on the show uh or what are you gonna do now you're gonna go down to the uh the rock and roll hall of fame no the diamond grill in downtown akron is this old steakhouse it's a great place and uh, they, uh, have you, uh, do many of the students go to the NFL Hall of Fame? They, they do, and then uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and uh, the Science Museum down there and then uh, the Cleveland Museum of uh, Natural History and Art Museum, phenomenal places to go. Yeah, and just one shout-out to Americans. Uh, football is really soccer in every country except for a couple, and it's United <laughs> States, Canada, and Australia. Uh, and you know why soccer will always be the most famous sport ever? Because there's no, it's the lowest cost. I mean, imagine if hockey was going to take off. Well, you can't build an ice rink in all these poor countries and deal. But it's so cute when you go to uh, um, parts of Asia. I remember I was in Brazil. These kids are out on the street. They're all barefoot, just got shorts on. All they need is a soccer ball. But they would take the number of their, their star, and they didn't have the money for jerseys. They would just take black charcoal and write the guy's number on their skin. It was so damn adorable. But, uh, okay, well, I hope you guys have a rocking hot Friday night. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much.